Hi. So before moving ahead, I have a couple of questions for you. So, so if you are a software engineer or a developer, can you raise your hand? OK, good. So what about data scientists? OK, OK, good. What about the other people? Teachers, students? OK, OK, good. Uh, now I have another question. So if you're a software engineer or a software developer, do you think that your job is to write great software and fix bugs? Raise your hand if you agree with this. <laughs> OK. Uh, what about the data scientists? Do you think that your job is to build uh, great models and ship them somewhere to production? No? OK. OK, interesting. OK, cool. So I will tell you what is my definition for, for my job. Uh, I work as a senior software engineer in a company called Infarm in Berlin. And I think that I'm not paid to program. I'm not even paid to maintain someone else's program. I'm paid to deliver a solution to the business. So if that's your feeling, that was also my feeling uh, when I discovered, yes, uh, programming is a part of my job, but it's not really the role. And with this, I want to start to talk about DevOps. So first of all, DevOps is, is a culture, is a set of practices, and is a set of capabilities. And the goal of DevOps is to shorten the system development life cycle while delivering features, fixes, and updates frequently in close alignment with business objectives. And this is really important. So what you can find like, when you think about DevOps, um, you can see many things. You can think about uh, CI, CD. You can think about version control. You can think about monitoring. You need to have a learning organization. This is really important because you need to be open to failures. Uh, you need to have logging in place. You need to have ADR. You probably also need to run runbooks. Um, you need to learn and to experiment with the concept of lean development. You need some agile stuff in place. You need documentation, testing, alerting, metrics, SLA, deploy strategy, and many other things. So DevOps is a really big concept, and there are many things inside that. And also DevOps, it's, it's not a set of tools. I mean, DevOps is not just CI or CD. It's not having Jenkins. Uh, it's not running your uh, machine learning jobs on Airflow. It's not having Kubernetes. It's not the morning stand up. It's not just that. And to me, it's not a role. I mean, it's, it's fine if you, want to call, if you want to call yourself DevOps engineer, but it's, it's something that should be like, spread around your company as a culture. And in the end, the true essence of DevOps is empathy. And you can check this, this quote. There, there is a beautiful blog article about this. And now I want to talk about Pokemon. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, the writing on DevOps pr principles. And you can see Pikachu moving from you know, plan, code, build, test, release, deploy, operate, and monitor. And this is usually the development life cycle of, of software, no? So you probably plan something with your PO or PM, then you start code, uh, you build this, you test this, and then hopefully you release this. You deploy this, you operate this, and you keep track of this. So with other words, it's a never-ending process of continuous improvement using the feedback that you get when you have end-to-end -end ownership of your systems. Have you ever heard the concept of end-to-end -end ownership? Yes, no, or it's something new? Not many hands. OK. What about the concept? I mean, it's more or less the same. You build it, you ship it, and keep it running, hopefully. OK. So usually when you, I mean, you, you create your code, you have your repository, and then you hand over your application to someone else. Is this your practice, usually? Yes, OK. OK. So what's the problem with data science and with machine learning? And I need a Pokemon again. So this is the problem, generally. Oh. Uh, Pikachu is still quite happy, but you miss many parts of the life cycle. So usually you're uh, focused on your code, on building, and then you hand over your things to someone else. And this is where you start to have problems. So usually the feedback cycle is like broken or has never been there. Um, and this is also also common for uh, software teams, but it's especially true for data science team or for machine learning teams. 
And how did it happen? Uh, that's a good question. I have, I have no idea, but actually I'm just lying um, because I, I have a couple of opinions about this. But I want to focus on the solutions. And one of the solutions to this problem can be MLOps. So MLOps means, as you can probably imagine, machine learning operations. And if you check inside Wikipedia, that's the definition. Machine learning operation applies to the entire life cycle, from integrating with model generation, software development, life cycle CI, CD, orchestration, and deployment to health, diagnostic, governance, and business metrics. That's what you can find about machine learning operation on Wikipedia. And my reaction was, what? It's not like DevOps? What's the difference here? I mean, if you go back, the only word, I mean, it's model generation, the only, the main difference. So, I don't know, it's, it's, it's the same or not. Or maybe I'm missing something. Um, if we think about, I mean, a simplified version of uh, running a data science team, you, you pretty do the same stuff, like, you know, you code uh, somehow, then you train your model, then hopefully you ship your model, um, you operate the model. So from my perspective as a software engineer, they, they really don't look so different. Especially if you think uh, about uh, models like services or microservices. Uh, do you recognize this picture? Okay, this comes from, so it's a paper. It's a paper from Google. I think it was published during 2015. It's called The Hidden Technical Depth in Machine Learning Systems. Do you see the machine learning parts? Do you see the machine learning parts? So that's the only part related to machine learning that you have when you operate machine learning systems. And if you look at the image, uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's more or less, uh, well, I mean, I deal with configuration every day. I, would, I deal with data collection, maybe not feature extraction, or I would call it like in a different way. I have the serving infrastructure, which maybe it's pretty big, and I have all the rest. I just miss the machine learning code. Um, so my advice is don't try reinvent every software best practice from, from scratch. Again, this is my opinion, but we have pretty big things in common, so there is no sense to you know invent like a new culture like MLOps when you have DevOps that that works quite well. So the goal is not really to play with names. I know that from a marketing perspective, it's 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 okay to uh, you know to build up new names because then it's really hard to sell DevOps again or under a different umbrella. So another concept that I would like to introduce is the concept of production readiness. Have you ever heard about this concept? Raise your hand. Yes, okay. So who has a production readiness checklist or score for the services that is running? Like before deploying, uh, just, okay. Just, okay, one, just one, okay. So production readiness is a measure of your capability of shipping business features in a reliable way, constantly, and without compromising quality. This is my definition. And I want to put a uh, focus on the concept of reliable, constantly, and without compromising quality. Uh, production readiness is, is a spectrum, so there are multiple things inside, and they are also related to, um, to DevOps concept and DevOps cultures. So, again, these are things that can contribute to production readiness. There is version control, and I know many uh, data science teams that they still don't do this. Uh, they, they keep their code on the local machine, or they, do, they use S3 as a version system, which is not a version system. Um, business requirements are satisfied, so you know what you need to work on. You have clear understanding from the business side about the things that you want to do. It's not like continuous experimentation for six months. Uh, you have CI and CD in place, and that's extremely important. 
because otherwise you will have only you know, manual processes. Observability is also another important concept. So you do monitoring, you do logging, you do tracing. Um, especially monitoring and logging are really important because I know, again, many companies that they're shipping the models and then somehow they, they broke during you know, Friday and they just realized this on Monday and they, they have lost like two days of you know, production services. Another thing is the concept of runbooks. And it's, it's documentation of runbook, is how you should run your application or how your application should run. And then orchestration systems, that's another big concept. Um, who is trying to implement a cloud native infrastructure inside his company or inside her company? How many hands? Okay, cool. So dealing with infrastructure now, it's, uh, it's really easy. You can just buy it. You have companies like AWS, GCP, DigitalOcean, whatever, um, that are offering this as a service. And uh, I mean, luckily for them, it works quite, quite well. So if you consider uh, Jiki from GCP, it's the uh, Kubernetes engine from, from Google, it's a managed service and it works really well. And you don't have to worry about managing the masters, for example. Another thing, another very important concept is one-click deployment, uh, deployment and rollback. So the concept of rollback is, okay, something went wrong, I want to switch back to the previous version. And another pretty cool thing, especially if you want to do testing in production, also for machine learning, because maybe you want to test different models at the same time, is canary deployments. So you run multiple versions of your application at the same time. Um, again, also testing spectrum, because if you start to work with microservices or services, uh, unit tests, I mean, the concept of unit tests, integration tests, end to end tests, uh, they start to be meaningless. So you want to start to test in production. Another important thing is documentation. It's always important, especially if you work uh, in software related things, and also if you work in machine learning stuff. And especially when you work with orchestration systems, health checks are fundamental uh, because you want to uh, know a tiny at any given moment, if your service or microservices is working correctly. And of course, there are many more stuff. Um, and I mean, you can, you can define them. You can define your metrics, you can define your alerting system, you can define what it means to you to be production readiness. I mean, in this case, production ready. And then we have the concept of production readiness checklist for machine learning. As you can see, it's a working process. So it's, it's always open to improvement. It's, it's also up to you. I mean, it depends on your business case. But what's the goal of having a checklist? Um, you know, of having something in place that you can check every day or before releasing a service or before starting working on a service. Like, what is the things that I need to do properly? And why do I need to do these things properly? So one of the reasons is to increase quality by setting clear requirements and processes, which is extremely important, especially if you're growing as a company. So the goal is that you don't do a release until everything is checked. This is like ideally, so and if you're super cool. And personally, again, in my, um, in my private or in my company checklist, I will put things like using version control. That's extremely important also for infrastructure, also if you use infrastructure as a code. So everything uh, has to go inside a GitHub or I don't know, GitLab repository. Uh, another fundamental thing is that almost everything is automated. And the only thing that you do is git push and that's everything. From there, everything is managed through, I don't know, CircleCI, uh, Jenkins, Travis, and also you, you can control, I don't know, your deployment process directly from Tower or from another platform. So it's really one-click deployment and one-click rollback. That's also really important. Um, and this is especially true for machine learning models because you want to have a really simple way to train your models and to deploy your models. Because probably, I mean, usually and correctly, you should do this many times during the day or during a week. Another important thing is that you can introspect your system. Have you ever heard about the concept of introspections? So it's getting the current status of the system from the outside. Okay. And 
basically you want to answer to a couple of questions like, is the machine learning model working correctly or can I understand why the prediction uh, or, uh, or the classification that I get from the machine learning models are deviating from what I expect? Or I, in more simple terms, can I uh, easily get which version of my model is running in production? Uh, that's like a, an easy question, but often uh, companies, they, they, they don't know what to answer. Another thing is um, you have metrics about your system and specifically about machine learning ops or data science teams is the number of requests served, the latency, the statistical distribution of your inputs and of your outputs because you want to see if something is changing um, when, you, when you run your model in production because maybe you were expecting something completely different. And you release often and you don't have a release day. The concept of having a release like, I don't know, Tuesday or uh, Wednesday, it's something that I really don't like. I mean, every day apart from Friday is a good day uh, to do a release. And another concept that I really like is to think about models as a service. Um, so a machine learning model is basically, our, at least what, what we are trying to do is basically um, a Docker container so you get all the nice things from Docker and you just deploy it. So you just wrap the model in around you know, an API and then you just provide it as a service. And this is extremely useful uh, because then you, you get the orchestration for free because it's already there if you're using Kubernetes on another system. And you, you really get like other nice things. Like, I mean, you can run different versions of your models at the same time. Again, this is extremely useful because you can just run like ready direct part of the traffic to a new model, just I don't know, 10% or 5%, and you can check how the model is working, if it's working correctly or not. So you can do introspection at runtime in production, which is extremely useful. And also, if you think about models like services, uh, you can just roll back to the previous version of the service because uh, you have your Docker container version. So uh, another thing that I also often hear in, in the machine learning community is the concept of reproducibility, which is okay, but at the same time it's strange because many of the results that you get with the machine learning models are stochastic, so they are random. So another important thing I think is to define what it means to you to uh, the, the concept of re reproducibility. Uh, to, to some company, it means that we save everything in S3 and the models are version, so each of the model has a proper version. Uh, you can do the same with Docker containers. But it's, I think it's really important to define what it means to you, especially if you have, I don't know, uh, particular needs like uh, related to privacy or to explainability. And these are all things that, that you, can, you can learn. Um, and they are extremely important, especially again if you want to grow as a company and you want to have a really nice engineer culture. And it's, it's much more easier to learn this stuff through osmosis or through cross-pollination. And this means to put together data science team and uh, software teams. I don't really mean together, but closer. So I have a bad experience of people from the data science team working in, in another building. And that's really hard because when you get things like, okay, we need to ship this to production, it's almost impossible. I mean, you need to start from scratch. Um, and like I said at the beginning, it's more connected to empathy. It's really about working together and try to simplify the release process and to, to have it work correctly. And again, we, we already have all these practices and I mean, it's, it's fine to create new marketing brands and all these things, but it, it's just get things more complex. Like in this case, like I was looking for a job position like this morning and there is this DevOps production readiness engineer and there is a company looking for this role in Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, and I have no idea about the requirements. It's like, like I said at the beginning, I mean, DevOps is really a culture. It's something that comes also from the tops, from the management. It's, it's, it's not 
you cannot hire like a DevOps engineer. It's, it's something that you need to spread around your uh, technical teams, whether they are DevOps or, I mean, whether they are doing ops or whether they do mainly um, software development. And it's the same for the data scientist. Thanks. Thank you very much. There were a number of, number of questions. Uh, the one with the most upvotes right now, why is Friday not a good day for a release? Uh, because then you need to have people on call during the weekend. Uh, and it's fine, but you need to have people on call during the weekend. Someone doesn't like to live dangerously, right? Yeah. <laughs> Do you version control your data? How? Uh, that's a tricky question. Uh, no, we, we don't version control our data. Uh, there are many like new projects also inside the Python community. Uh, there is Pachyderm, I think. It's a nice thing. And there is another thing called VDC, I think. Uh, version data control or something like this. But no, we, we don't do like um, version control for our data. If someone who, who was asking it has ideas about version controlling your data, uh, you can also come and, come and talk about uh, how you do that uh, in the Lightning Talk, maybe. Uh, how to handle lazy coding habits from DS, like Jupyter Notebooks, no object-oriented pro programming, etc., from a DevOps or ML Ops point of view? Can you repeat the question, sorry? Yes. How to handle lazy coding habits from DS? Uh, what, what is DS? Data science, got it. Jupyter Notebooks, no object-oriented uh, programming, et cetera, from a DevOps or ML Ops point of view. Yeah, that, that's really bad. So I'm a big fan of Jupyter and Jupyter Notebooks, but I think it's extremely bad to start learning programming to a Jupyter Notebook. I was yesterday or two days ago uh, inside a pilot's meetup in Berlin. They, they needed to set up their computers for a Python course, and there were people that were trying to understand the Jupyter notebooks and they wanted to use a Python terminal like a Python REPL and an editor and they couldn't understand why it works like different. I mean, I want to put my code inside the browser and I want to do the same with the editor. And I mean, then it's really hard to explain them. I mean, you know, that's, that's one way, but that it's not like the main way. Uh, so there, like, let's, let's call it the correct way. It should be to put your code inside the editor and then you run it. Uh, yes, that, that's that's bad, I will say, because then you put in place bad practices and you need to push them to unlearn that practice and to teach them the correct one. Yeah. But it's really hard to put Jupyter Notebooks in production. <laughs> that would be hard, yeah. Uh, if you were to give someone three pieces of advice and not more to get started with the ML Ops or DevOps principles, what would you pick as most important? Uh, you you don't so try to don't avoid the pain because you need to feel that try to what to don't avoid the pain okay a pain related to you know the release process fixing things monitoring logging so as soon as you feel that then you start to you know act um, to to fix these things I think that the most important thing is having uh, CI and CD in place. Please can you share your slides with us. Yeah, sure. You want to see the Pokemon, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pokemon, of course, yeah. How do you factor security or security by design uh, into your ML DevOps setup? Ooh, uh, it's like related to access to the machines, you mean, or? Uh... I don't know. Uh, would someone like to clarify who asked the question? I don't think we have a clarification. I mean, usually right if you use like Kubernetes or a system like Kubernetes, you should have like security by default, uh, which means that anything that you can do uh, should be okay. I mean, uh, well, that's a problem. I don't like to move binary pickle around. Uh -huh. Sorry? I can you repeat the question for the recording? I just heard the binary, the pickle one. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? I will. What? Oh. Okay, so I think you can read the second question. There we go. Yeah. So I'll repeat that for the recording. Yeah. How do you manage uh, uh, using pickles 
uh, used by ton, uh, tons of machine learning libraries in production, especially given their binary size and security vulnerabilities. Yeah, I don't like to do that. I think it's a bad practice. Uh, usually I put the, the PICO, I mean the binary file, the PKL, the model, inside a container, and then I move containers around. Also because the PICO is related to the Python version and maybe to the version of the software you're using. So you need to keep them in track, which is usually painful. So uh, I, I mean, you can put your, uh, your, um, your models into S3 as a PICO and then you can you know, load and do things with this, but I, I don't think it's a good practice. Local machine or cloud services? Local machine or cloud services? Local machine for what? For learning your models? For training your models? You mean having a, I don't know, like, local machine or cloud service? What's the question about? Yeah, whenever you, questions are asked, it's always better not to use abbreviations and, and try to explain yourself. We could just skip that for now. I mean, if you work for a company, it's not just for playing or you know to learn something. I, it's, I mean, cloud service. It's it's the only way. I would say. I was thinking different, like uh, like two or two years ago. I really like to run my bare machine, but it's just painful right now. And it's so easy to use cloud services. Now, question by George, uh, and I probably mispronounced this one. What's your opinion on standardizing a file format with a built-in schema, for example, Parquet or Avro, uh, across an organization? Uh, the sooner you have a schema, the better will be your life. That's my answer. So you can, I don't know, you can use Avro, you can use Parquet, you can use whatever, but uh, really specify your interface as soon as possible. Okay, thank you very much. Thank this you. Christian.